Happy Monday, everybody. It's February 5th, 2018, and we're having a happy hour with Jim. So rather than go through the regular whitelist stuff, if by the way, if you want to receive our emails, please make sure to whitelist us. Uh, just to let you know, we're running a Valentine's Day promotion, and it's all the way through February 14th. These are the codes. Um, the codes will also be available on the slides after we post the recording of the webinar. If you have any questions or concerns or, you know, about if this program is for you, et cetera, et cetera, please contact me. Email me or give me a call. And I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Let me give you, make you presenter, Jim, one second. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, there will be many people that will explain to you what's going on in the uh, current market, and I'm sure that you are unlikely to hear the same thing from any two. Um, this is one of these things that everybody thinks they know, and actually nobody really does can be sure. What I'm going to talk about breaks down into trading, investment management inventory, and fundamentals. And I think those are all really, really important. But I'm, I'm going to start with the trading side of the market. What you're looking at is a, is a monthly bar. And that monthly bar, the, one of the things that I talk about is momentum trading. Momentum trading is the most prevalent kind of trading out there because people think that they understand it, and it's the, it actually is the easiest to learn. I equate momentum trading very much like going to a racetrack where you can bet on the horse until the horse is a foot from the finish line. Most tracks, you know, and the legitimate tracks, you have to bet before the horses leave the gate. There's a betting pool, and from the betting pool, the odds are established. In momentum trading, you can always bet. And what happens when momentum trading gets going, it just kind of feeds on itself. If you look at the chart, you will see on 14 months, we have one time frame higher. One time frame simply means that the low of the next month did not take out the low of the previous month. The breakout, the upside breakout occurred right here. And then for 14 months, we one time framed higher and then you see you just got a real upward spike in January. And also at that time, there were reports that it was uh, the highest inflow of public money into mutual funds. And so the public finally got hooked again, coming off the sidelines, putting their money into the, into the market. When you get this kind of one time framing higher, there is no backing and filling. In other words, you know, nobody takes profits. And the really large investment firms, and I know a lot of them, I've heard a lot of them, they have been long the market for nine years. And they see what this market's doing. So they say, well, even if they don't believe in being long the market, they think it's getting too risky, they're afraid to leave the market because if they leave, their relative performance is not going to be as good as their competitors. And the other thing they'll say, well, you know, we're just going to roll, we're just going to roll with it. So all of a sudden, there's there's no selling. The market just gets longer and longer and more and more profits into into the market 
So your potential, your potential for having some of those people get scared off is very, very large. So it breaks down. So the trading side, the momentum trading side has been blindly long because it's worked for so long and particularly the last 14 months, one time framing higher. I've been in this business 40 years. I don't know if I've ever seen that. And it's just an unbelievable um, move. And people think, well, I've got to get in the market because look at what I've look at what I've missed. So you you finally get to the point where they start to take profits or like momentum goes the other direction. But there's usually some kind of trigger or catalyst that leads to that change. So the first thing I've got down here is, you know, what got us to the highs? Um, and trading is about the change. And then first of all, what got us to the highs? Let's just go with that. Central banks all over the world provided liquidity. We heard the central bankers, particularly in, in the US, come out and say their goal was to get people to buy stocks that would raise the price of the stocks, the companies would feel better, and therefore they would invest more in plant and equipment, and they'd hire more people. And of course, the individuals got more enthusiastic. So that was their goal. And their goal was to push up inflation to at least the 2% level. Then when it got to 2%, well, then they kind of they kind of waffled a little bit. And like anybody else, they were afraid to be the spoiler at the at the party. So they came up with reasons why, you know, it's a little too early, not quite yet. And then you have the central banks all over the world doing the same thing. So, so how do they drive interest rates up? A lot of it is they buy assets. They buy bonds and mortgage portfolios, and they buy that. There's a floor underneath the market. Interest rates go down, and their goal is to keep interest rates lower. And they were very comfortable. That worked very well for quite a period of time. Like any party, it eventually comes to an end. And of course, what we have historically seen is that when these government agencies do this, they almost always overstay the party, which then makes the adjustment when they've overstayed the party more difficult um, on the downside. And so now it started last Tuesday, the, we look, when, when we're talking about trading and in our in our educational programs, we always start in showing people, we always start with the monthly bar chart. So we've seen for, for months, years, the market's going straight up. As a trader, don't fight the trend. So that we look at the monthly, it's been going straight up. We look at the weekly and we get another trend, we get a, an intermediate term trend, and we look at the daily, so we get some idea of the shorter term trends. Well, last Tuesday, we gapped lower, and the intermediate term, or the, the, the short term trend turned down. Last Friday, when you look at a weekly bar, we traded down below and took out um, some prior of some prior weeks lows. So we saw that the intermediate term trend turned down. Then we're looking and say, okay, what would be the first sign that a longer term trend might turn down? Well, the first thing, the first thing is it always going to, it's always going to start to show in the weekly. So it starts to show in the weekly and of course in the weekly. And now today we had the monthly taken out. So we, we've got those flows and that keeps 
that keeps the point when that when all those trends have the potential to turn down, then you start to get liquidation from long term money managers, you start to get liquidation from short term holders, and then you start to get fear from the public. So what is what is going on now? Um, so we've got that's kind of the trading side of it. But now we, we take a look and say, okay, is there any fundamental changes underway? And you'll hear a lot of people tell you, no, there's no fundamental changes underway. You know, earnings are good and growth is good and everything else. Well, I beg to differ with them. I think there is fundamental change taking place. And part of that fundamental change is that we have inflation. What has triggered this market? Higher interest rates. Higher interest rates were triggered by inflation. So we started to see wage inflation, and we get, it's more costly. Um, the growth is out there. And it's more costly than buying things, plant and equipment. But the wage, and we've had full employment for some time. And they kept talking about the fact that full employment wasn't to the point it wasn't the paychecks weren't going up. Yes, you had full in, employment, but you weren't getting wage growth. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, we've reached the point where in the market, good news is bad news. For a long time, in the markets, bad news actually took the markets higher. And bad news took the markets higher because everybody said, okay, the Federal Reserve and these other central banks will keep plowing liquidity into the market in order to keep the party going. And, and that was fine when you had bad news, which meant, okay, if you got bad news, how do you keep from having bad news? Well, you keep supporting these, the markets and adding liquidity. Well, now we're to the point where good news, and as you know, this market, we had a good employment report the other day. And what did the market do? On that good employment report, the market turned down. Because we're now to the stage where good news is bad news. Because not only will we have good employment numbers, but also the wage inflation or the wage growth was up, starting to trigger thoughts about inflation. And anybody that's been around for any period of time knows that once inflation gets hold, it can be really ugly and it can take an awful long time to get out of the markets. I've been trading for over 40 years in, in the markets. I'm 77 years old. Um, I've act I actually got in the, in the market in my, in my early 20s. So I've seen a lot of this, and I know a lot of a lot of history that's that's going on. So then you you hit um, inflation, wage growth, and other costs. Then interest rates start to go higher, and as interest rates start to go higher, well, that makes it more costly to get a, to uh, to buy a home. Mortgage rates go up, so that starts to slow the the uh, the, the growth uh, home 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 growth. And you know a lot of what's fueled uh, this market has been has been the real estate market. You, you read all the time how strong that market is. So this then starts the higher inflations do a lot of things. Another thing that you, I don't hear anybody talking about is one of the things that has helped this market go higher has been we've had a softening dollar. Let me just take let me just take a second. Let me show you what that what that looks like. Just to make it a little more real in your mind. Okay, here's the uh, here's a monthly of the US dollar. So we've seen the dollar going down for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 months. So remember, we talked about prices in the market have one time frame higher for 14 months. 
what's the dollar done over that period? The dollar over that period has gone lower. And the dollar goes lower as, as interest rates are soft. In, interest rates are, the dollar has a tendency to go lower. Take a look. We've got a little upturn in the dollar right now. And why? As we get higher rates, higher rates become supportive of the U.S. dollar. As the dollar strengthens, that puts more pressure on our, it makes our companies, our U.S. companies, less competitive overseas. When the dollar is weakening, it makes these U.S. companies more competitive. When it's strengthening, it can make them less competitive. Now, right now, it's it's minor right now, very, very little, but we do have a slight uptick in the dollar. So you got to say what goes on there. Now, if in fact, it goes to the point where we get a, you know, a contagion from what's going on in these markets, and it starts to spread across, you know, many uh, global countries. Now, there has usually is a tendency for money to come into the US dollar as a safe haven. So that can also begin to put pressure on our um, on our assets. The what we're really talking about here in, in really layman's language is that you know the Fed, the Federal Reserve as well as other central banks around the world have controlled the punch bowl and they've kept the punch bowl full. Now there's the potential for them to take the punch bowl away. And when they take the punch bowl away, uh, it's probably time to leave the party. And so other, some of the other fun, fundamentals that, that take place is that the, well, the central banks, they will have to sell assets. They've got these huge portfolios. Just the U.S. just the U.S. Treasury portfolio is, you know, going to be a trillion dollars larger this year. That's you know eight, up 84 percent they report from last year. And remember, when rates are going lower, that makes financing the federal debt relatively inexpensive. What happens to that federal debt as interest rates start to go higher? it gets more expensive to finance large federal debt. So that's another element into the, uh, into the equation. Um, now, other things that take place, investment managers now start to rethink PE ratios, valuation, you know, all of these kind of things. People have said for a long time that, you know, uh, Stocks were too expensive. Uh, PEs were, you know, were not right. But everybody said, oh, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. Well, now all of a sudden, those that said they don't understand, they may find out that they really didn't understand. So now you get, if you get a rethinking of valuation, you get a rethinking of uh, PE multiples and a real thinking, a, a, re a rethinking of you know, of what growth is, you know, under a more inflationary uh, environment and a higher interest rate environment, well, now you may get a total change taking place in the market. And a lot of times these valuations can bring stock prices down quite a bit. Now, and, and, and don't forget, the another thing that markets don't like, markets don't like uncertainty. When the market was going up and everybody was, was you know, happy following the last election, the market had a huge run to the upside. Uh, we started out this year, you know, we can see that this year was a huge run to the upside, which now we've taken back. We've taken all of that back. And I think the correction now, I guess, at the lows, probably someplace around 8 or 9%. Eight or nine percent, and and so you know we've got it. There's already a potential change in thinking, but political uncertainty. The market doesn't like uncertainty of any kind, and it doesn't like political uncertainty. So as the market was going up, people didn't worry about it. But all of a sudden, now you you get a day like last Tuesday, and then you get last Friday, 
and you get today, now all of a sudden, you know, people start rethinking the whole thing and they decide this uncertainty about the political situation, you know, may not be exactly what they want for for stocks. And so this, you take this and it can start to trigger the momentum in the opposite direction. But let me give you a what normally happens in markets. And this can be very and this can be very important to how you think about your portfolio, how you think about your trading, how you think about repositioning. It is very rare that a market goes from a bull market to a bear market. Normally a market will go from from a bull market to a balancing market and then either back to bull or back to bear. A lot of times that balancing market takes the form of what we call a bracketing or a trading market. It is not unusual to have the left hand edge of that trading range established in a nonlinear move to the downside. Now, when I use the word nonlinear here, uh, I'm talking about the concept where just a little bit of force can overextend the movement to the downside. And that appears to be what is going on right now. You're getting that nonlinear move to the downside. Well, very, very often, that nonlinear move establishes the left hand bracket of a trading range. And that trading range can go on for some time. So the market goes down, you, you think the market's never going to rally again, and all of a sudden, then the market starts to recover, and it goes into a trading range or into a, a, balancing, a balancing type of atmosphere. When the market is at the highs, the attitude is that assets or stock prices are unfair to the seller. So when the market starts to balance like this, what it's trying to do is find a level where there is general agreement between the long-term buyers and the long-term sellers about what is fair asset pricing. And it's that balancing process that helps us arrive at that number. Well. Once the market comes into balance, it usually doesn't stay in balance very long, but that's the process. So you, you get in the balance, and that balance sometimes, I've seen it last several months, back and forth. So then you start, then we go back to what we call more and more swing trading. So you get more and more opportunities to do swing trades, buy the lows, sell the highs. When the market's been going up, what all the traders and all the asset managers are doing, they've been buying the breaks. Large large investment advisors, they've been buying the breaks. Tra uh, hedge funds have been buying the breaks. Traders have been buying the breaks. And when uh, when the market goes down or starts to get a new range, then you when you bracket, then they start to sell rallies and they buy breaks. And that goes back and forth till you get this balance in the marketplace. Once you get this balance, now you see what you know how people adjust over a longer period of time so just because you get a trading range that doesn't necessarily mean the bull market is over it just means that now is a time when there is adjustment taking place and of course there'll be different sectors and things will act differently so again nobody Nobody is going to probably address this the same way I do. Um, I look at many things. Like I say, I've broken it down into uh, a trading mentality, the momentum type of thing, um, investment inventory, whether it be from in large term and large uh, uh, size portfolio managers uh, that, you know, the big, big firms or trading firms and, and mutual funds or you know, those that are just, you know, considering a change in, in fundamentals. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's one thing. And I think that 
the mistake you can make is oversimplifying what you see going on in, in the market here. But right now, I think it's all of these things that are taking place. You've got a, a change of liquidity. Um, the, the central banks around the world have been adding liquidity. Now they're more than likely going to be draining liquidity. Rates have been low. Now rates start to move back up. The central banks have been, you know, adding that liquidity by purchasing assets. Now they'll probably be, you know, selling assets. So you've got a lot of the inflation's picking back up. You've got a lot of these things taking place. So change is occurring. People, markets don't like change, but change does take place and it happens all the time. So, um, Jen, let me stop at this point. And keep in mind, folks, I'm not an economist. I'm a trader. But let me try and, ad and address some of the questions that may be out there. Okay. Um, Jim, have any comment on LM on the LM high near 2697, the BCD highs early on? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about I – want, I want to talk about the – the, the bigger picture that we're talking about here, you know, on the uh, sure. on the economy and the, the overall sure. market. For those, one second here. And if there's not, I, I, you know, I understand. Um, I was just trying to give you some kind of an overview of how I see uh, the market. And the change, and of course, the economic conditions and the fundamentals leading to the situation we currently find ourselves in. Okay. Today in the morning tweet, you described low volume and emotional selling on Friday, and then you said that this resulted in long risk. Could you explain and elaborate on that? Oh, uh, how does this bigger picture affect our day trades? Well, it, it, it starts to affect it because, you know, what I'm saying earlier you have been, you know, day traders as well as swing traders. You know, they've been they've been buying any break. And now if we start to go into a more of a balancing market, then you're looking to see uh, more like selling rallies and buying breaks. This is kind of, you know, instead of going one way, the market starts to go two ways. Right now, right now it's going down, it's going lower. Um, but you know that will it will begin to to balance out, and then we go into more. You know, you'll need more uh, trading awareness rather than just straight up buying the uh, buying the breaks. Well, it, it doesn't sound to me like we have many questions. It sounds like the questions coming up are mostly, you know, very short term uh, questions. And I was kind of looking for bigger picture questions. If we don't have any, if we don't oh, have any, got a few now. Uh, okay. Any comment about the potential for the unwinding of risk parity strategies like Bridgewater and many other funds use? Oh, I, I think that that is um, uh, I think that is something that is very likely to happen. What what it is we don't we don't know the different positions all of these firms have. So you know as they start to to go from um, adjusting risk as the market's going higher, then they start to adjust portfolios for more of a rotational market or more of a market that's going lower. Because I mean, it's one thing when it's going up, it's another thing when it's going down, it's another thing when it's moving sideways. So somebody asked me late this afternoon, you know, this, this break, break this afternoon, you know, what does tomorrow hold? And I said, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Uh, this afternoon, when we had a you know a break, uh, a pretty good rally to the upside, uh, I thought that may be up for the downside, and then it turned around and went down and made substantial, substantially new lows. And so when somebody asked me about the model, I said I don't know because I don't know who out there. I don't know if there's any firms, any trading firms that went bankrupt, you know, or belly up for Chapter 11 during today's break. Friday and today, it certainly has happened in the past, and it certainly can happen today. And even it does, if it doesn't, you may hear rumors of that of that sort. Um, you know, you'll probably get margin calls tomorrow, 
And I, I just, I don't know of what firms out there may be making broad scale changes um, in their thinking and in their risk adjusted portfolios. So I think there's a point in time which you need to let these things work their way out because they don't, if the firm is smart, you know, and they're making major changes, they don't advertise them. They'd like to disguise those as much as possible. I remember one time when I was on the uh, on the Chicago Board of Trade floor, uh, we had a, a a broker who was a you know traded for himself, uh, so he was you know what well, was considered a local, but he did more brokerage for some of the big hedge funds than any other broker on the floor because they used him because nobody thought to watch what he was doing. They didn't understand that he was operating for some of these very large funds. So people work very hard to disguise, you know, what they're doing. Because what happens if firms get an idea, trade other trading firms get an idea what somebody is doing, then you have this tendency to get the substantial piling on. And that can, you know, that can cause a lot of havoc and hurt your positions tremendously. So I think I think you have to let these markets settle before you get some idea what is going on. I mean, you know, this was just a huge break today. I think it, it the Dow, I believe the Dow was the uh, was the strongest, was the biggest one day move in history, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think at the lows today we were down near someplace near nine percent, which is kind of historic. Uh, you know, low. The last big break I saw was down 9.99 percent, and then it rallied all the way back and made and made new highs. So, you know, there's a lot of things to be worked out in here, and we don't know. We don't know if today was over. Okay, other questions. Yes. What is the likelihood likelihood that today's sell-off was also programmatic when the VIX spiked? Oh, I think. I mean, the the, the VIX the VIX is very interesting. You know. It was, you know, it got down under 10 for a long time, and then uh, we got up. The VIX went above a, a 15 or 19-week high today. Um, so we went from one extreme to another. I think one of the things that takes place in markets like today that makes them go down is, you know, they're, they're not as much programmatic sometimes as people are out there, and even some even very large portfolios are buying puts to protect their portfolio. When they buy those puts to protect their portfolio, keep in mind that somebody had to sell those puts to them. The person that sold those puts to them in order to protect their position may then have to turn around and sell stocks. Now, that's a hard concept for a lot of people to understand. But, you know, if, if somebody is buying puts and you've got market makers, whether they be, you know, large institutions or trading firms that are, you know, allowing them or selling them those puts, if this market starts to go down, they have to protect themselves. And the only way they can protect themselves is by buying, uh, is by, I'm sorry, by selling stocks. And, uh, that can accentuate the move to the downside. A put is a form of insurance. So when some of these firms or some of these large investment houses or traders buy insurance, which is mean buying puts, that means that there, whoever took the other side of that may have to sell stocks in order to protect their positions. Years ago, we had a famous break in the, 19, in the 1987 break. Uh, they had something they called portfolio insurance. It was, you know, um, suggested by a, a firm in, in San Francisco, one of the firms that advised hedge funds. And I remember them coming to me one day and, and trying to sell me this idea. Uh, and I said, no, I'm not interested in your idea. And they said, well, why not? At this time, there was basically six or eight firms that advised the largest pension funds in the world. And they said, why not? I said, don't you understand? If anybody buys your portfolio insurance, 
uh, if the market starts down, that means they have to sell more and more stocks. Well, I mean, this firm, you know, walked away from me and laughed. Well, then you found when 87 came around and you had that big break, you had a lot of people saying that the cause of that break, which was the largest in history, um, was a result, a lot of the result of portfolio insurance and how that so-called protection accentuated the move on the on the downside. Okay, what else have we got? Okay, uh, this is a major bull run that could be coming into transition. How long do you expect the bracketing process to last approximately? Yeah, yeah there is no expectation. Um, it is usually not overnight. It usually takes several months. Um, and it's not, it's not unlikely that in that back bracketing process, the market doesn't go back up and, and make new highs. I have, seen, I have seen that happen on several occasions. Uh, one of the things that we talk about um, in our uh, educational trading courses is it is rare when a all-time high market or all-time high trade takes place in the electronic or over the overnight market. And right now, uh, I've, I've written that probably 40, 50 times in the last couple of years. The current high was made in an overnight market. So we are sitting here right now. The all-time high as of right now occurred in the overnight market. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we may not go back up and take that out. It might be some time, but it, it's a consideration that you have to take into effect. And as I say, markets generally go, don't go from bull to bear. They go from bull to bracket, back to bull, or bull to bracket to, to bear. And so it, I would, you know, it could take many, many months in there. Um, nobody knows, nobody knows for sure. And that's why, you know, you go, you, you learn to adjust and give you what the market is giving you rather than, you know, say, well, this is where it's going. Because we don't really know, but what we try and do is look at it every day and go with the um, go with the market. Look and see what is it giving us. Okay. Other questions. Could you consider this a huge liquidation break that is going to strengthen the market by bringing more new longs? The it is so far, so far it has all the signs of a liquidating break. The volume, the volume today um, declined almost in every period. Now, that's normally not what happens. Normally, when the market goes down like today did, normally uh, volume is increasing. And, mar and volume kept decreasing throughout the session. So usually that's a sign of liquidation rather than a more potent combination of new money selling and liquidation. However, one of the things you have to keep in mind, if anybody has been in my classes, one of the things that you, you will hear me say very often is that the large investment managers, when they're holding, port, they're holding their portfolios and they have their clients and their clients call them and say, well, my golly, what's what's going on in this market? And the first thing that they say is, well, this is actually very healthy uh, for the market. It actually brings the market back into balance and allows us to go higher down the road. So that's that, that's where their comfort, and that's the first thing that they tell their clients. Well, just as myself and many of the traders we from time to time will panic. The long-term investment managers pride themselves on not panicking. The truth of the matter is they panic. They just don't do it um, as often. And when they do it, they do it in far larger size. If you look back in the market nine years ago, when the market made its low, the last there was a, a Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and then the large investment firms started selling 
everything they get their hands on. Today, we had probably probably three billion something in volume. I haven't looked at it. But back in those days, all of a sudden, we had days that were showing 14 and 18 billion shares day. And keep in mind, that was nine years ago. Because all these, you know, very confident investment managers, they panicked at the end. And once they panicked, that put that was the end of the market. And we've been up for nine years. And that's why a lot of them you continue to hear it's the most hated rally ever because they got out they got out right at the wrong time so it you know it a lot can happen so as you say right now the what they'll be telling people is this can be healthy for the market and you may be absolutely right and that may be what this liquidation break is right here however what happens and what i've explained many times is that these managers, you know, they had the conversation I just mentioned. And then all of a sudden, when the market gets off, you know, 8, 9, 10%, you know, they go home and then they start to panic a little bit. And then they start to think, well, you know, maybe I ought to raise a little cash. Keep in mind, many of these firms, cash, their cash positions may be someplace in the area of 1%. A lot of them are fully invested almost all the time. I ran investment managed hedge fund research and investment manager research for um, a very large firm. I've watched what goes on. And so they will be very comfortable. And then all of a sudden, you know, they say, you know, well, maybe we ought to raise a little cash. Well, you know, if these firms go out and raise five or six percent cash. That is a huge amount of selling in the in the market, and that's usually when they when they panic, and a lot of times that will end the the break. So I don't know what's going to happen. You may be right; it may absolutely. So far, it's only liquidation, but these large firms generally that money doesn't come in the market until it's been off for some period of time, and what I explain it, it's like dripping on them, and it drips on them until they just can't stand it anymore. It's like somebody nagging at you and you try to put up with you and finally you turn around and blow your top and say something you wish you hadn't you hadn't said. So that that is one of those things can that can take place. Well let me let me do this uh, at this point. Um I'm not in any hurry, but there's a lot of people that came in here for two reasons. Some people came in just to hear, you know, kind of some view on the overall overall market. The market was also built, the webinar was also built for those that have any interest in our intensive. And I, I did the uh, the market side first, the bigger picture side first, for those that have no interest in staying around, um, you know, they're not, they're not obligated. They're welcome to leave. For those that do want to stay around and talk about the current educational intensive that gets underway on February 26th, which I'm already doing uh, daily uh, daily uh, reports as well as uh, online chat throughout the day, I will then take those questions. So let's stop this portion now uh, and ask Jen to just to review with you uh, very quickly the the pricing for the intensity for just a few minutes, and then I will go go back and I will deal with questions you may have on the educational program that will be coming up. Jen, you want to take over? Sure. Can you see my screen now? I can. Okay, great. Um, so we just want to let you know uh, that we're having this Valentine's Day promotion from now till February 14th. These are the codes. If you have any questions at all, by all means, um, be sure to email me at dalton at jimdaltontrading.com, or you can also call me um, at this phone number right here. Oh, right here. This is the number. Um, just to kind of quickly go through um, what's included in the intensives, uh, daily webinars. We have the tentative schedule posted in the view details of the course section, so if you need to see what the webinar schedule is like and kind of like how the topics are laid out. You can go and see that schedule. Um, all of the webinars are recorded so that you will have access to them after the fact or if you miss one and can't make it. Uh, you'll get two daily reports 
and the live commentary, which uh, Jim is giving away for free right now if you sign up early so that you'll have uh, basically almost a whole month of reports and live commentary to get the jump on things. And also something that we've added that we haven't really uh, advertised is that if you sign up, um, you can also get Jim's li live commentary uh, via a private Twitter account. So if you have Twitter and you want to be able to um, have it on your mobile device or have an audible ring, just so that you know exactly what he said and when he said it, um, you'll be able to sign up via a private Twitter account for that. There'll be Q&A sessions every week in case uh, you know you need something clarified or you have other additional questions. We're going to have a daily synopsis video recap where we try to point out um, it's a time-lapse video. I'm not quite sure how long it's going to be yet, but obviously it won't be like an hour or anything like that. But it will have all of Jim's observations and comments pointed out um, in the video, and you'll be able to see how the, the profile developed during the day. Um, and then we'll be, you know, there's always additional webinar sessions that usually get added. As of right now, we have over 61 hours of webinar scheduled just for session one alone. So um, those are all of the things you get. Like I said, if you have any other questions or you're wondering if this is really right for you, by all means, you can take the, a moment right now to ask those questions, and I can ask, get those answered for you right now. Uh, if you've got questions with regards to um, our intensives, or you feel free to call me or email me. Okay. Let me let me also say that uh, um, each morning we start off with an hour and a half, about an hour and a half, sometimes two hour. Well, but well, excuse me. I'm sorry. Webinar, live webinar. So we're there with you live as the market opens, and a lot of times that helps get you set up for the day, so you have some idea what the trading day may look like. And then the continuity goes on from there by the live chat that uh, pops up on your desk or on your mobile device. Okay. Um, for those somebody, that have, somebody was asking before market open or during market. I'm not sure if they're what they were referring to, but um, we always have a webinar at the start of the day uh, about half an hour before the market opens. So that we can go over, you know, what happened in the overnight session and discussing about scenarios for the day. And while, while I'm thinking about it, um, and I think we have another webinar coming up on this uh, on the 13th. But just to um, bring it to your attention, in the the business section of the New York Times yesterday, um, there was a big article on. Uh, the advantage you get from uh, they're telling you that the real the real profits happen in the overnight session not in the day session for you know spy and s p traders etc um we had already had a web uh, uh educational webinar on overnight trading scheduled for the 13th of february i believe that's the date and uh well that will still take place but if you if you go back and find that article, if you want to attend that webinar, read that article so you know what what is said in there. There's a tremendous amount of there's nothing in there that is blatantly wrong. There, however, are a lot of things that are very misleading that if you don't understand um, the markets you're looking at could get you in an awful lot of trouble. You know, as we say in in the programs that we offer, no real learning starts until you have an understanding of context. I believe that comes from what's in her, her, her what was his name, her, um, the Greek philosopher, Herodotus. Um, I think that's what he said many years ago, but that is very, very true. And trying to understand what that article says without understanding uh, the context surrounding each day. Uh, can make it very difficult. Also, trying to trade the markets uh, on a daily basis and do day trades, particularly early in the morning, without understanding the importance of overnight trade and the inventory conditions and what that may mean uh, can be very harmful to your trading. There's, there's a lot of things involved that you really need to understand in order to, to do short-term trades in these markets. Okay, um, let me take any questions. Okay, that maybe well, I just wanted to point out one thing because one person asked, 
about, you know, what times of day are we having, you know, what the schedule is like. This, I just wanted to point out, this is where you'll find this, the tentative schedule for course one. This gives you all the times and the dates for the types of things that we're doing for the webinars and everything. I just want everybody to know that this is out there and it's under the course descriptions for the bundle and for course one right here. And Jim, there are plenty of other questions related to, you know, the volatility and questions with regards to today. So if you have extra time, we can uh, spend the time here to get those questions answered because there's well, there's quite a few. Okay. First of all, before we go on, um, would you show folks the dashboard of our site so they, they see how to, you know, when they go into the site, how to move around in it? Could you take a second to do that? Right, sure. Okay, so this is this is what the dashboard looks like. When you make a purchase with us, you need to make sure that you create a new account when you um, go through the checkout process. After that, you have your username and your password that you created. You go to my account right here, and this is what the dashboard looks like. So you'll find an over, overview right here, which is, you know, probably only if there's some messages that we need to point out some things. That's what we'll put right here. The daily reports, this is where you'll find all of uh, Jim's daily reports, meaning the morning and the evening report. And everything is here listed for you and archived so that you can go there and access them. Afterwards, you can also, um, for example, this is the one from the weekend. This was a big one, a big report that Jim wrote. Um, and just to let you know, you can, you can hit the print button here, but also um, I'll be posting the PDF for it too to make it easier for people uh, to access that. Uh, all of the live, I mean, all of the recorded webinars that we have, you'll find them over here, as well as the daily synopsis videos and additional resources would be listed over here. So any handouts that we give out or things like that, or, you know, like I said, the tentative webinar schedule would be posted over here. And really what I want you to understand, how, how easy it is to move around uh, that site and get at the information that you want to get at. Okay, let's open it up for uh, the, the, the questions that you have there. Sure, one second. Let me, I, let me give you back the screen so that you have that. Okay, and I'll get back to questions. Uh, Jim, do you think that the XIV effectively is going to bust in after in the after hour session will lead to a market sell off tomorrow. And I believe the XIV is a fund that bets against volatility. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, I don't know that the answer to that question. Um, you know, I haven't even looked. It's just, I don't have any idea what's going on after hours. Okay. There's the, uh, uh, after hours trade. Let's take a look at it. Um, Okay, so there we are. Uh, um, I don't know. It's not. It's not recording after. It should be recording after hours. It's not showing. But after hours, um, uh, there's no great recovery uh, in this. There's no great recovery uh, in this market at this point in time. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, today in the morning tweet, you described how low volume and emotional selling on Friday, and then you said that this resulted in long risk. Could you explain and elaborate on this? The that was a little un, unclear. Um, the direction of the market, the direction of the market, uh, was fairly, you know, fairly dynamic on on uh, Friday. When you get a market that's down, you know, six hundred plus points, it is rare when that market turns around on a dime and heads back up. Now, at the same time, what was going on is I thought that the market had gotten too short on Friday, and I thought the market would have to rally before it broke further. And then overnight trade, um, overnight trade was also um, very short. So you had a couple of things going on. Is if you remember this morning, the market opened, broke a little more, and then we rallied substantially all the way all the way back up into Friday's range. 
And so at that point in time, inventory was too short to go much lower. Once you go, and sometimes when a market rallies, sometimes it has to rally before it can break further. In other words, you have to let that inventory readjust. And that's what happened this morning. And then the market started to break down again. But it's very rare following a move like you had on Friday of 600 and some points that the market turns around on the following day. It's not rare to have you know more of a balancing type day, uh, but it's rare to have a um, significant recovery. Now today's market, you know, is is off all day long, um, you know, just unbelievable. And I don't really know, I don't know what to tell you about today. It's off substantially. Um, and I, I don't know what's to look for tomorrow because like I said earlier, I don't know, you know, what firms may be in trouble. I don't know what traders may be in trouble because one of the things in markets, markets always have to take care of current business first. So if some trading firm went bankrupt today and or margin calls as a result of today, that is current business. And the market has to take care of that current business before anything else happens on the following day. That's why it's very hard to have any real certainty what is going to happen following a day like today. Now, the volume today really wasn't that high. Um, Jen, can you pull up today's volume and we'll take a, a look at it on the site? Uh, sure, one second here. Let me take back the screen then. I'll just show you something that, you know, is it's just it's something that I look at um, throughout the day, and, and so this the volume it's it's on our site. You go to resources, and then you see the NYSE volume. Notice as the the market, and this is this is by time. So you notice that um, as the market. Uh, can you make it just a little bigger? Sorry. Okay. So you, you say that the market, um, it's 6,000 less, 21,000 less, 101,000 less, 115,000 less, 173,000 less. Notice that the volume, the volume all day long was less than the volume on Friday. That makes me, somebody asked before, you know, are we seeing just, could this just be liquidation? When I see the volume drying up like that, that is more of an indication that we are looking at liquidation, not a more powerful combination of liquidation and new money selling. Um, so I was very cautious about that all day and, you know, and said, okay, uh, let's be very careful. The market may have gotten too short today, but I mean, this was, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but my caution, my caution is that we did not have a lot of volume today. And we did not have a lot of new money selling. So it's, it's the potential for a short trap is in there. I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but that potential certainly exists. Okay. You want to give me the screen back? Sure. One second. And incidentally, that volume is available on our on our site, um, you know. Once you uh, become a, a a client, now we get the we get the volume from Yahoo. Uh, we've kind of formatted it, but we get the volume from Yahoo. And from time to time, it's gone down, and we can't do anything about that. So we have had some periods when uh, they haven't fixed their volume. Okay, questions, please. Yes, with regards to volume, um, one person was asking that the NICE volume has been relatively light. So your thoughts on that? You kind of well, uh, went over that. Well, so that's what I was just saying. Yeah, that it's a it's a caution. You know, once a market gets a tone for the day, it tends to continue in that direction. Uh, but the the low volume is a caution to me that you know the, this could be a short this could be a short trap uh, in this market. And you want to be very, very cautious. You don't want to just automatically be on the short side of this of the market. Okay, other questions? Um, there's a heck of a firecracker on the downside. Do you see these lows as a magnet to the downside? 
I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, the firecracker effect is usually when you have many lows or many highs very close to each other. Um, you know, we took out an awful lot of things that existed today. I mean, there were places where we had that. Let me get over. You know, you you uh, you had it in here. You know, and you, you had some down in here. But, you know, you went through areas that I never would have thought that you went through today, not in one, in one day. So I, I would say I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be so concerned about the firecracker effect right now. I'd be more concerned by just saying, what does the overall market um, look like as we open tomorrow? And I would try to keep, I would try very hard to keep a very objective uh, view because I don't really know. It could be, it could easily be a short trap, um, but I'm not going there because I don't know. Like I say, I don't know what, Current business may have to be taken care of tomorrow, such as margin calls, uh, firms that uh, are in trouble, can't meet their margin calls, or any trading firms that went, uh, you know, went bankrupt today. And that's that does happen on moves like this. Remember, this was the biggest move uh, in history for the Dow. OK, a couple more questions. Sure, we have plenty of questions, actually. Um, after the balancing, are you saying that either could occur a 50-50 chance, a continuation of the bull market, or the appearance of a bear based on the changes that you have just described in the larger scheme of things? I, I never, you know, I never put like 50-50 on anything. I'm just saying that historically what has happened, the market goes from from bull to balance or trading range back to bull or bull to balance to bear. You know, you have to watch how that bracketing takes place before you get some idea, you know, or start to get some idea of the odds of continuation one way or the other. One of the things that makes me think that the odds aren't bad that we will rally back up towards the all-time highs are the fact that the all-time high was made in the overnight market, there are several daily highs that were made within a tick or two of each other. And that is usually a sign of liquidation rather than new money selling. So I see what I've seen so far looks to me like new money selling. Um, I'm sorry, like liquidation rather than new money selling. But keep in mind what I said earlier. It is not uncommon for these large term investment firms that once the market's down eight, nine percent, that all of a sudden they get scared and then they start to raise cash. And keep in mind, their cash positions sometimes around 1%. So all of a sudden they raise, uh, go to 5% cash. That is a huge amount of um, securities and equities that come into the market. Again, one of the things we say, you, you've got to, you know, rather than get these grandiose ideas in your mind, it's going to be a bull, it's going to be a bear, is let learn to let the market develop in front of you. And then what we do is we we look at the weekly, the daily, the weekly, the monthly, and then we analyze the profiles each day to get some idea of what is the underlying strength of the weakness of the market and watch how it does it develops. Nobody knows in advance. There are about people that think they know, but very few people really do. And those that knew this time usually don't get it right the next time. Okay, another question. So it sounds like, Jim, that you think that we're most likely in a balancing period in the market and that that can then be followed by a larger decline or balance and then continue rallying. Is that so? I, I, it sounds like you're putting words in my mouth. Um, we, go, I, I, we go from usually what happens, what sets up, the trading range or the balancing, as I said earlier, a non-linear move that forms the left-hand edge of the trading range. And I say non-linear in the sense that it takes very little in order to, you know, the the what it takes very little to start that, and then you get um, quite a large move to the downside. Then it starts to rotate back and forth at some point. Um, but I don't know 
if then it goes to bear or goes to bull. It usually goes bull, balance, back to, back to bull, or bull, balance to bear. I don't know what the outcome of that is. You know, earnings are still pretty good on these companies. I mean, you know, there's still, we're, we're not talking about really bad things. We're just talking about maybe some readjustment. Okay, other questions. We have had central bank intervention like never before. How does Jim view this as far as the bank's ability to contain downside risk? Well, that's kind of what I was trying to address early on. Uh, I think the banks got over enthusiastic on the upside. They made it, they, they pumped liquidity into the market for an extended period of time for years. And nobody was, you know, nobody was willing to leave the party, you know, uh, early. And the tendency is they almost always overstay themselves. So now it makes it more difficult um, for these banks to, uh, you know, to come in and, and prop up the market because they've got, they've already done so much, they don't have a lot left in their in their quiver. So I think that's one of the risks that we have in the market, that these banks, now they have to raise interest rates uh, more than likely, and they have to, you know, sell some of these massive portfolios. And remember, I said just the U.S. Treasury, it's up $1 trillion this year. That's 84% over last year, and it's, you know, and they're going to have to finance it at higher interest rates. It costs more. That's not a particularly easy situation to uh, to live with. Other questions? Why do you think volume was relatively low for such a huge break? Because I, I think it was liquidation. I don't think it was new money selling. I think when, it, when this liquidation takes place, uh, people get scared and the buyers just step aside. You know, the buyers said, well, I don't know what's going on. They just stopped buying. So, the, I mean, we saw this. Remember, we saw this same thing, on the, same thing on the upside. You know, these markets went up day after day after day with very little volume. And, you know, you didn't have anybody willing to, willing to sell it to them. I mean, you know, they just kept going up. So since there weren't any willing sellers out there, the market just ground higher. Well, guess what? Yes, a Friday and today, it's the opposite. You don't have any willing buyers. Markets are very fickle. They can turn very quickly. So, you know, um, we've gone to selling, uh, buying every break to selling every rally now. But I didn't see any new money selling. I saw liquidation uh, and I saw momentum selling, uh, but I didn't see any really good solid investment money coming into the market. That doesn't mean it won't be there tomorrow or down the road. Okay, again, other questions. How would Jim rate the underlying structure of the auction going back 14 months? The underlying structure of the option? Of the auction. Oh, auction. Oh, I think it's quite poor. No, I, th I think it's quite poor. One of the things that I've written about several times, and we've talked about, there's no real backing and filling along the way. So let me kind of, when I, let's go back to the, um, this monthly bar I had up here. You know, the, for 14 months in a row, the market one time frames higher. There was never any backing and filling along the way. Um, and, you know, so when it started to break, backing and filling is like elevator stops. You know, an elevator, if an, elefa if an elevator, whoop, I'm getting, my tongue is getting dry. If an ele elevator starts to fall, there are stops built in that, you know, cushion that fall, bring it to a stop, let it go again, bring it to a stop, let it go again. Well, we haven't had that in this, we haven't had that in this market. It's gone straight up. So when the market starts to give way, you don't have logical places where the market moves sideways and, you know, it gives you a chance to slow down. There's a little bit right here, a little bit right here, but then, then after that, look at that. It's just people were just so afraid they were going to miss the market. They couldn't stop. And you had every, every individual, every place you read, you had to be long the market. And, you know, well, that ran out. 
So you don't have any backing and filling, and that can make that can make markets very dangerous when they start to give way because they can go a lot further than you ever thought. Okay. The monthly ranges for January and February are very large as compared to the ranges for the preceding 14 months or so. What does this sudden increase in range tell us? Well, I think the I think the big tell was January's range. That was, you know, that was kind of like the the end of the uh, the end of the race. Uh, everybody by that time, everybody knew you had to get into the market. Everybody knew that there was no risk. Everybody was betting on the horse till the horse crossed the finish line. And like I say, a week or two weeks ago, I think it was the record um, record amount of new money from individuals coming into the market for some period of time. I, I'm not sure that, but I think that's what it was. Well, guess what? Everybody says, I got to be there. I got to be there. And when everybody's got to be there, that's usually the that's usually the end of it. So I think you had that that big move up in, in January, and that kind of marked the end of it at least for now. Okay. Please ask Jim if he would consider calls since we might be overly short. The I don't I don't think I don't think there's a need to go out and buy these calls. One of the things that's going to happen to you, let me show you, let me go over here and let me put the VIX up here. Okay, here's the VIX. So the VIX backed off a little bit. We're 37, we're 37 right now. And you can see that's the highest in, I don't know, this is almost two years or maybe, maybe longer. I don't remember. But What's going to happen, so if you go out to buy calls now, you're going to pay an awful lot for those calls, an awful lot. If the market starts to rally, the VIX is going to come, the VIX comes, the VIX comes in or goes lower as the markets rally. It expands as the markets go down. So going out and buying calls, you'll pay a, a dear, very dear price for those calls right now with the volatility up this high. And as the market rallies, they'll they'll uh, crush that volatility and it will be, you could have the market rally quite a bit and actually lose money on your calls. So I think it's a very difficult, I think buying calls right in here uh, until the market settles down is very difficult. Other questions? Jim, what advice would you give someone who was long in a period, long, long in a period understanding high odds for short covering, but in trying to monitor for continuation sold when B period went back to exactly half back and missed the rally? I'm sorry, you're going to have to come at come at me again. Uh, what advice? What advice would you give? Give someone who was in a lot who was long in a period understanding high odds for short covering. Oh, long in a period. I think they meant to say someone who was long in a period understanding high odds for short covering, but in trying to monitor for continuation, sold when B period went back to exactly half back and missed the rally. Well, the market, I mean. I mean, the market gave way the rest of the day. So uh, this morning, you know, if you sold in, in B period, I don't know exactly where, uh, if you're talking about half back for the A period or for the day. But, you know, this morning, monitor for continuation. This is value. It was going to be very difficult to get unchanged value today. So you gapped open this morning, and the gap trading rules are if you do fill the gap, but it doesn't look like the gap is uh, that value is going to build at least unchanged relative to the previous day. Then the odds are good that the market is going to break later in the day. So, you know, if you uh, if you got out too early today, I don't see the sin. I don't see the sin in that because um, the market, you know, it barely got into 
yesterday's range. Now, I was long this morning. I was long. I had calls this morning because I thought the market was rally. I thought it was overly short. Um, but then when it got up here and it just died, and you know, I said, well, I don't think there's anything there. And then it started to one time frame lower. And at one time frame lower for the remainder of the day, it never stopped one time framing lower. One time framing mean, you know, it didn't take out the previous uh, periods high. One of the cautions I have about this market as a potential to rally is if you notice how close B, C, and D period are together. Notice that this big break, the J period broke just a little bit below I period. Very mechanical. Um, you know, in there, um, M period broke just a little bit prior to L period. That Those kind of things, when I see that, that's it's usually an indication to me that I'm looking at a lot of short-term trading, not investment money. Investment money or really large traders, they have no idea where those levels are. You know, those are short-term trader levels. You know, uh, so again, uh, I don't think you missed anything. All right, go ahead. Jim, a lot of people are reporting that this sell-off is due to automatic traders, i.e. computers that have initiated selling due to sell points being hit. What's your take on this? Well, remember, I, I think there I think there are a lot of things in here. Um, remember, one of the things that I brought up, and I said, when the markets start to sell off, people buy portfolio protection and how they buy portfolio protection they buy puts when they buy when they buy puts the people that sold in the puts only have one way to protect themselves or you know one of the ways to protect themselves is they have to short stock so i think you've got to take that into account blaming it all on algorithms blaming it all on computer programs is a little suspect to me um you know i think there's a lot of things that I think there's a lot of things at play. Inventory was awful long. We just looked at January and saw that, you know, the craziness of January was the biggest range where we've seen in, you know, in a couple of years to the upside. We saw that it was the biggest, uh, you know, increase of money coming from, from the outside from the retail, you know, investor that's not normally in the market. Uh, so I think you've got to bring in a lot of factors. Trying to nail it down to one factor. I think is very, very dangerous and probably too simplistic. Okay, I'm going to take uh, just three more questions. Uh, my voice is getting dry, and I'm going to go have dinner. It's uh, getting to be 5:30 out here. Okay. Um, would the ES high being made in the overnight and no excess on the RTH highs be an indication that the auction is over and the top is in? One more time. With the ES high being made in the overnight and no excess in the regular trading hours highs be an indication that the auction is over and the top is in? No, I would be, I would, I think it would tilt the odds just the opposite way. Would you say the same for, uh, let me see, whoops, missed that one, one second. Jim, was the fact that it could not reach unchanged from Friday, increase the odds of downside today? Oh, sure. Sure. It's always, you know, um, those are always, um, you know, un well, uh, there's unchanged from yesterday. It couldn't hold above it. Those are always, uh, and I, I, I put out on the chat comment today, one of the chat comments I put out that after we made this new high, I said that unchanged slash Friday's low was support. And then we came down and broke that support. So we broke that support early. But so that was, but I think that, I think the chat comment was written unchanged slash Friday's low were support and support was broken. And once that support was broken, yeah, it bounced, it bounced once came back, but then it was over for the remainder of the day. So I think it was very important. Okay, final question. 
How much is the impact of a new Fed chair on the markets? I don't know. I, I there's there's going to be people that tell you that, um, and I, I think that I think that makes a nice makes somebody sound like they really know what they're what they're talking about. And then you'll hear people say, "Well, this was just the market uh, testing the new Fed chair." Uh, you know, but long before the Fed chair came in, remember we had that uh, that big up move I showed you in January. We had the huge amount of you know participation by you know retail investors uh, that hadn't been in the market finally gave up. We had the uh, change in interest rates. We had the great empl employment report. We had an increase in uh, uh, wage wage wages and potential inflation. So there's an awful lot of things going on. Uh, and I think it's easy for people to say, well, this is because they want to test the new Fed chairman. Um, you know, it may sound, make somebody sound smart, but I, you know, I doubt if that's the reason for it. I just listed a whole bunch of things that in the run that what I talked about earlier that I think are far more relevant. I mean, yeah, might it take a percent or two? Yeah, the uncertainty of a new Fed chair, it might have a little bit to do with it, but I don't think anything meaningful. Okay, final question. Um, what is the range of the new balance area? If today's low holds tomorrow, that would be the low of the balance area, and what about the high? Could we consider the break from Friday as the top of the new range? Nope, you don't know that. You know, you, you, you're trying to think about things that, you know, you have to let the market decide and let the market tell you. Once you get, you know, once you get a, a range in, you know, you get a balanced range in, and sometimes you get a low, sometimes it'll go back and extend that row, low a little bit, you know, uh, and you get a little bounce there. So you don't, you don't know. And markets just aren't that exacting. And you have to see what happens. Um, you know, we'll see what, if we get carried through tomorrow, I don't know what may go on. I, like I say, I don't know who may be caught short. I don't know what forced liquidation of accounts and margin calls tomorrow. We have to wait and see what, you know, what the day brings. I'm just saying that the process usually starts with a non-linear break that that very often sets up the left-hand edge of the trading range. Then it kind of works itself out, usually over several months. All right, let me say thank you. Um, and remember, you know, if you want to, if you want to join us on these educational courses, on the intensives, all I can do, I can't promise you'll make money. I can promise I will give you everything I have to give you a fair perspective on the market and trading. The most difficult thing a lot of people have to do is give up a lot of things that they have held dear to themselves for many years. And if those things have worked and making you money, then keep them. But if they're habits, then you have to really question if some of those things that you have used and held on to in the year over the years, if they are really hindering your growth and your productivity from a trading standpoint. Um, you know, hopefully we, we will challenge you. Hopefully we will do everything we can to give you honest information, teach you about the auction process and how to begin to read, you know, the auctions on an individual basis. Like I say, we always start with the top-down approach. We go from the monthly, weekly, daily, and we do that. We start with that top-down approach in order to break many times some very narrow thinking that you have. So many people start uh, doing their preparation for the follow. Well, a lot of people don't do their preparation for the following day, and that is a killer. But a lot of people start looking for really tiny points and references and things like that. And you're so much better off to get a bigger picture perspective and then work from the bigger side to the smaller side and then plan your trading for the next day. And like you say, we come in every morning. Uh, we do an hour and a half to two hour webinar in the morning in order to help you get a perspective around the opening, uh, review overnight inventory. Uh, we will have some suggestions of what may work. 
we will you'll get the live chats throughout the day uh uh they're not always right but they're an honest effort and uh, then you get an evening report and the daily report and then jen is doing a a recap of each day a video recap to give you some way to go back and look at the day and think about it once again let me say thank you we would love to have you join us join us and we will promise we will give you every effort that we can uh, in order for you to be successful in your trading once yes. again thank you for spending time with us Thank you very much, everybody. This webinar is recorded and will be posted later tonight. I just wanted to show you where you can find our recorded webinars. In case you didn't know, on our website, all the public webinars that we've been doing, we've been uh, recording them and placing them over here under resources, public webinars. This is also where you find our upcoming webinar schedule so that you can sign up. So as you can see, we have these other webinars uh, scheduled for the future and we keep posting new ones here. Uh, this is where you go and sign up for them. And here's where all of the recorded ones are, along with any slides that we may have had with them. So um, this recording will be posted over here later tonight. Thank you very Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye-bye.